You know, I was always a Star Trek kid. I don't dislike Star Wars. I was never able to connect to it as well as I did Star Trek, however. That being said, I've always enjoyed Star Wars books more than Star Trek books. So it's not an easy decision for me to pick up um, Star Trek The Motion Picture, the novelization, written by Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek. Yeah, I had to figure out a way to fit that in there somehow. Now, I cannot say I'm the biggest fan of the first Star Trek film. A Star Trek The Motion Picture is long. It's kind of boring. I mean, I, I enjoy watching it, but it's no Wrath of Khan. And if you get a chance, Wrath of Khan is awesome. So, how does the book stack up? Well, if I'm being honest, this might be the single horniest Star Trek novel or Star Trek anything I've ever seen that wasn't made by a fan. Seriously though, like Roddenberry must have been in a dry spot with his wife when he was writing this, but it still makes for an entertaining read. Now before we get into the meat and potatoes of the book, the movie was written by Alan Dean Foster, which means Roddenberry was coming in to make a novelization off of a product he created on a movie he himself didn't write. Which makes it kind of interesting itself. It's, it's kind of like Alan Dean Foster made this nice aesthetic building for offices and maybe hospitals. And it was just this perfect aesthetic, clean building. And Roddenberry came in and said, this place needs a Hooters. And the best part is that the book takes a lot of pride in Gene Roddenberry writing. If you look at the back, it literally sa says on the back, the writer and producer created Mr. Spock and the other Star Trek characters. Like Captain Kirk was just along for the ride. But it made sense at the time, though, because it, Spock was kind of like that show's Fonzie. And if you don't know who Fonzie is, ask your dad or your granddad, and they'll let you know that Fonzie was really cool. Uh, let me think of a better character for the younger people. Urkel. It, not saying that Fox is, or, or not Fox, not saying that Spock was Urkel like. Um, Spock was a character who wasn't meant to be front and center, but everybody loved, kind of like Urkel. Urkel was not meant to be the focus of Family Matters, but so many people loved him that the writers are like, well, screw these other guys. Let's just make it about this annoying, high pitched, squeaky voice guy. Spock was that type of character, as was Fonzie. Um,. I guess Screech from Saved by the Bell, maybe? I don't know, I never watched that much Saved by the Bell. I found it to be very annoying. But regard, I, I'm sorry, I kind of got off path, didn't I? Now, one of the things that the book does cover is the will-they-won't-they they that people have um, regarding Spock and Captain Kirk. A lot of people seem to be under the assumption that Kirk and Spock were more than just friends or brotherly love and were, you know, um, getting all pond far more than just seven, you know, every seven years. And there is a part of the book where Roddenberry actually felt the need to explain it, or at least very give us an idea of what's actually going on there, which in my opinion, like, if you want to believe that's going on, knock yourself out. It's fiction. Who cares? But Roddenberry definitely wanted you to know for certain. So, the book gives us a description of Spock leaving for Vulcan to go through a process to get rid of his remaining emotions. Um, he refers to, in his mind, to Kirk as a, and I'm going to probably mispronounce this, Tehila. Now, I'm certain that if there's any Vulcans watching, I'm sorry, I know I said it wrong, but, you know, I barely speak English, much less a fake made-up language from space. And also, if you're offended, you're a Vulcan, so you're not very good at being Vulcan. You should probably go and get that process done that Spock had done. But Spock, before he leaves, he goes on to state to himself that he won't even allow himself to think of Captain Kirk or even his name again. It, it does sound kind of romantic in a weird way because he's pining over him as if he's a lost love. But the, then he refers to him as his Tihila. 
And it turns out this term means either friend, brother, or lover. The reason being is for Vulcans, it's all the same. It's just somebody you're really close to. The physical stuff is just something that goes on on the side. Now, the book goes on to get Captain Kirk's take on it. And he states, I was never aware of the lover's rumor. Although I had been told that Spock encountered it several times, apparently he had always dismissed it, not dismissed it, dismissed it with his characteristic lifting of his right eyebrow, which usually connotated some combination of surprise, disbelief, and or annoyance. As for myself, although I have no moral or other objections to physical love in any of its many earthly, alien, and mixed forms, I have always found my best gratification in that creature, woman. Also, I would dislike being thought of as so foolish that I would select a love partner who came into sexual heat only once every seven years. So, Kirk himself said, nope, they've never been to Pound Town. Uh, he prefers women, though he's cool with whatever you're into. Um, now, mind you, this was written in 1980 from a movie that came out, I think, in 79. And if it came out today, somebody would be screaming woke at the top of their lungs. Now that we know that Kirk and Spock have never shared a bunk, what about Spock and Bones? Like, there's some angry sex that somebody needs to write about. But let's get off on, not get off, that's a bad choice of words, let's get away from that subject. And on to more sexual stuff. What stuff do you ask? Do you remember in the movie, the two officers that were in the transporter accident? We know one of them was Commander Sonak, the Vulcan science officer. But who was the other person that wound up being Starfleet flavored spam on the floor? The movie doesn't give us her name, but the book does. Her name is Lori Sienna. In the book, it's explained that after Kirk accepted his promotion to Admiral, uh, he and Sienna became very close. I think I read somewhere, I don't remember if it states in the book, I read that they were married. I don't remember saying they were married in the book, but they do talk about physical gratification a lot. He also goes on to express belief that she might have been part of a conspiracy to convince him to take the promotion to get him off the Enterprise. Yeah, this version of Kirk is a lot like the movie version where he's kind of bitter about not having a spaceship anymore. Uh, he's <laughs> just bitter in general, and he kind of sees uh, conspiracies to take him off that ship all over the place. So that characterization is still pretty tight and still pretty close to what we see in the film. But he does make it a point to let you know he is not bitter because they were what each other needed at the time and they enjoyed each other very much. He did, however, not react at all when she got turned to a big pile of silly putty along with a Vulcan. Now Spock makes a few references to sex, but not to enjoying it himself. Uh, he talks about when seeing Nurse Chapel again for the first time, how he, how she's still holding on to silly ideas of gratifying him physically and it's not going to happen. Now, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember exactly how he said it. But it was very much a, she's still pining over not being able to go to, um, I don't know, I don't know what the Vulcan term is for pound town, I guess. Um, I don't know, somebody tell me what would be a good term for Vulcan pound town. Either way, Later on, he's walking down the hallways. Um, I don't know what you'd call it on the ship. The hallways of the deck where the crew's living. And he complains about being able to smell people going at it. So he can also peek on you with his nose if he so chooses to. But then we go over to Ailea. Ailea? Ailea. That's going to be hard to say a lot. Ailea. Now, if you remember the movie at all, she is the pretty bald woman that shows up. Unlike uh, the first time where everyone just kind of looks awkward and, you know, kind of struck by her beauty and everything. Uh, in the book, it's made pretty clear that any man on the bridge when she arrives got wood. And I don't mean they hinted at it. They were clear that any man on that bridge got wood. 
Kirk makes a mental remark that he's not able to get up to greet her. Uh, Sulu gets told by Kirk to show her to her station and show her around, and he makes mental complaints that he has nothing to cover himself with while standing up. And it's not their fault because Ilea is a Delton. Deltons are a highly sexual race, and when they are, when a female is in a room with a bunch of men, that they don't know and they're uncomfortable, they release a bunch of pheromones. These pheromones make the men around them very horny. Now, as safety mechanisms go, I'm not quite sure how that works. Deltons must be different than human beings because I'm not entirely sure how safe a half-dressed, beautiful, bald woman would be in a room full of men who are now been chemically seduced into being extremely horny to where they're embarrassed to stand up. That being said, uh, yeah, that is a weird thing to add to this character. And I don't think the movie mentions it, though. That she does make it a point to tell Kirk directly that her oath of celibacy is on record. So, I don't know. Maybe there was something there. I always thought that was in reference to her. See, when she comes on, Decker and her make eye contact. So, it's pretty clear they have a past history. So I thought when she said, my oath of celibacy is on record, it was in reference to, no, I'm not going to have a problem working with an ex-lover. Turns out, no. She's letting you know, him know, and every man there know, I am celibate. I am not out to play right now. And I think if I remember right, it's kind of necessary. They have to take an oath of celibacy to go into Starfleet because human beings are not as as advanced as they are sexually. So I don't, I don't remember if it's dangerous or if we just wind up in like falling around like puppy dogs for the rest of our life. We do find out that's why Decker ditched her. Um, Decker in the movie is clear that they were a thing. Well, it turns out in the book, they were a thing, but they were never physical. Decker knew that if he ever got physical with her, he would not be able to leave and resume his job at Starfleet. So Decker runs off from what is essentially a sex goddess to go play in a spaceship without even saying goodbye. We find out that the reason for this, as I mentioned earlier, is that he didn't want to go all the way with the hottest cue ball on the pool table because he was scared he wouldn't be able to leave or resume his duties. Now, Decker did eventually get to go to Pound Town with Aaliyah, but there is an asterisk. In the book, Decker... Um, okay, so in the movie and the book, Aaliyah dies. And V'ger recreates her um, as a probe. So Aaliyah is dead. That thing that comes back is a probe that was just made so close to Ilea that her memories are there, along with emotions and stuff like that. Yeah, Decker uh, goes to uh, Fun Town with the probe. So, not his lost love, who just died a little while ago. He, he went and had sex with the robot that looks a lot like her. Uh, make of that what you will. But all that being said, the book was fun. It, there are other things in the book that aren't sex related, so they're not as fun to talk about. But if I go over all of it, you're not going to have a reason to read it. And I would honestly suggest you do. Um, which brings me to the questions I would often ask myself regarding novelizations. Number one, is it canon? Uh, with any novelization regarding a movie... TV show, cartoon, video game, whatever. Um, usually it can be considered canon until the next movie, TV show, or whatever comes out. What's on screen is always going to be your, so your canon, your solid canon. All the supplemental stuff is canon until what's on screen contradicts it. With this book, I'm going to say it's up to you. There are things that they talk about that I don't really think play in Star Trek anymore. 
but most of it has to do with um, Earth and how people are on Earth. And we don't really spend a lot of time on Earth in Star Trek, especially in the original series. So it's up to you, honestly. If you want this to be canon, as far as I'm concerned, I don't see why you couldn't consider it to be canon. I can't really think of anything that contradicts it directly as far as what's come out afterwards. Let me see. What else would I ask myself? Oh, would I recommend reading it? And I think I already said that earlier. I would. I enjoyed this book a lot actually um outside of the weird sex stuff i actually enjoyed reading it a lot more than i enjoyed watching it also uh you can enjoy watching or reading something with captain decker without having to look at eric camden the guy that played captain decker and thinking about his creepy creepy crimes if you don't know what i'm talking about and you are a fan of captain decker and or seventh heaven don't look it up because it'll ruin it for you, but the guy's a creeper and he's just a terrible, terrible person. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, I want to thank you for listening. I know this sounds rough, but honestly, I'm trying to get used to doing stuff like this. I've been thinking about getting into uh, voiceover work, and this is just good exercise to get me used to talking to a microphone and just, you know, playing around and having fun. Also, any excuse to read a trash book is a good excuse, and... I do refer to this as a trash book. It's not really trash, I would say. But I refer to anything as a trash book as a book that when you're at a bookstore and you're looking over the shelves, if you just immediately glance over it without thinking about picking it up, it's a trash book. It's not a comment about whether or not you would actually enjoy the book or if the book's good or written well or anything like that. It's just a book that doesn't get the attention that most of your other Harry Potters or something like that would get. So if you hear me reference something as a trash book, don't take it personal. Um, it's just my way of saying it, primarily because I joke with my wife about our library. She's into these really nice books, and she'll only buy hardbacks. I get excited if I see a novelization from 1982, and it's just this little paperback that's already yellowing and falling apart. It's my trash books. So um, if you would... If you are listening to this on YouTube, please subscribe. And if you are listening to this on any other medium, follow or whatever it is you have to do. And comment, be verbal, and I hope you're having a good day. And if you can, definitely give the book a shot. Thank you. Thank you.